The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Thursday, August 29th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps to the from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Yes, downtown Brooklyn, USA. I'm stumbling over my words, folks. Why? Because I'm on vacation. I'm not getting paid. I'm getting paid to relax right now. I'm not getting paid to relax, but I'm I'm paying to relax. Yeah, by who? Soros? Um, yeah, exactly. George Soros called up and he said, Sam, I think it's time you take a little vacation. Not just on me, but I paid by me. Uh, Sam, are you familiar with the Galapagos Islands? Well, I'm not on the Galapagos Islands. Someday, maybe, I hear it's nice. No? Well, can you just travel there or do they try to keep it, you know... Pristine? Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. No idea. I, to be honest with you, I think I stole that from Bumble. You, that you want to go to the Galapagos no, Islands? No, I think I just saw somebody say they wanted to go to the Galapagos Islands. Oh. And I just adopted it. You can steal a lot of good material from dating oh, apps. Oh, everything. That, 90% of what I do now is just basically stolen from dating apps. Talk about wanderlust. Yep. Folks, on the program today... Uh, a book that I've been talking about since we did this interview uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I interviewed uh, one of the authors, Josh Murray. The book was also written with Michael Schwartz. It's entitled Wrecked, How the American Automobile Industry Destroyed Its Capacity to Compete. It's, it's a fascinating story. And it's one of those things where every now and then I do an interview that I, for whatever reason... um it helps me understand dynamics that are much larger than the dynamic that's being spoken of. And this is a story of basically how the U S car industry destroyed itself and what the incentive structure was to do it. And it's, I think it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it, it carries out today. I, um, my, my, my former wife, uh, from Michigan, a lot of folks in her family and in around it from the car industry, Ford, a lot of Ford people in particular, some GM. And um, it's a fascinating story. You, uh, It makes you understand so much. And it's the, the incentive structure in a way that we just don't, I think that a lot of us like just don't, can't absorb in some way. Like it, with the thinking behind this, it's a fascinating story. You're going to enjoy it. Um, just a reminder: if you're a member, you're also going to hear a deep archive cut, and you can join that. <clears throat> you can go back and listen to it by going and becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. It's just pennies a day. When you become a member, you support this program. Uh, you have the free show, and you get the uh, fun half. Also, don't forget the AM quickie. We got that going every morning. If you want your five minutes news headlines and briefs, check it out. Uh, Am Quickie, it's in the Majority Report audio feed. It's free. Just sign up on iTunes or podcast or pod, wherever you, Spotify or Spotify or there should be one Spotify. There might be one. Stitcher, Stitchify, any of it. So check that out. Uh, in the meantime, uh, enjoy this um interview with joshua murray on wrecked how the american automobile industry destroyed its capacity to compete okay we are back sam cedar on the majority report on the phone it's a pleasure to welcome to the program assistant professor of sociology at vanderbilt university and author of wrecked how the american automobile industry destroyed its capacity to compete written with michael schwartz uh, joshua murray welcome to the program thanks sam it's great to be here um so let's start i i th- this is i i found it fascinating and um it's 
but let's start with where the the U.S. car industry is today in terms of its capacity, its profitability, the um, the jobs it creates. I mean, I want to look at it from both the perspective maybe of the the shareholders, but also the the community. Right. So. Well, first, uh, kind of defining what we mean by U.S. auto industry, right? So we could mean the auto companies that are headquartered in the U.S., or we could mean everyone that makes cars in the United States, which would include foreign automakers like Toyota, Nissan, Volkswagen, right? Um, So from a shareholder's perspective, we would kind of definitely think of the the U.S. headquartered companies, ones like General Motors, Ford, and they are profitable, um, but their domestic market share has been just consistently declining ever since the 60s, and that hasn't really changed in recent times. So they're consistently losing mar- domestic market share to foreign owned companies. Um, and their profitability is largely held up through uh, outsourcing jobs, outsourcing production to cheaper areas. Um, and that kind of then connects to the view of the U.S. auto industry from the worker standpoint. Um, from the worker standpoint in U.S. headquartered firms, the, kind of the big three that we think of, it's not much, right? So some, something like less than half of workers at Ford and General Motors work in the United States. Um, so they might employ, you know, say 200,000, 300,000 overall, but 100,000 in the U.S., um, for any given company. I think it's less than 100000 for Ford. Um, and that, that stands in stark contrast to the past when and in the 60s, General Motors alone employed over 300,000 auto workers in the United States. That said, foreign auto companies like Toyota, Nissan, Volkswagen employ U.S. auto workers. Um, but they tend to target non-unionized areas and pay lower wages. So the high-wage earning auto worker that we think of from the past is becoming more and more a thing of the past as the U.S. companies that are unionized send those jobs overseas and uh, to other countries that aren't unionized and the foreign auto companies target areas that are not unionized. And and when we say unionized, and I should also say, um, uh, Joshua, if you could uh, maintain... I'm not sure which location it is that's best, but it's sort of like floating in and out, How uh, your clarity. Um, but when we say unionized, what, we, what we're saying, I mean, it's almost synonymous. I mean, I guess maybe I want to make sure this, this goes with saying. It's synonymous with jobs that are more stable, that provide more compensation, that provide better uh, benefits, uh, that create more cohesion and stability within the community. I mean, that's what we're talking about when we say unionized. Absolutely. What, what, you know, what we really mean, what you're getting at is workers having power, right? And so unions are a, a well-worn way of workers having power, um, collective bargaining. But when workers have some sort of leverage, then their jobs pay better. They have better benefits. They're more stable. They're less likely to be you know, shipped off or closed down. And yes, that benefits the community. Um, so absolutely, right? So we're talking really about worker power and worker leverage. And so uh, in terms of the the American, um, I guess the American, I, I don't know, branded, uh, is that the way to say it? I mean, I, I don't know how you say yeah. it, the, the American branded um, uh, automakers, uh, Ford, GM, <clears throat> um, uh, and uh, Chrysler. Um, mm-hmm. We're looking at cars that, that we're looking at a, a shrinking uh, market share. And Mm -hmm. we are looking at diminished um, help, uh, diminished uh, value to the American community, as it were, in terms of workers and and specifically communities and whatnot. So let's go back. And then I guess your book is um, trying to figure out how that happened, because it used to be, um, and you could tell us specifically when, but it used to be that American car manufacturers were, in, in, in many respects, sort of, I don't know, what do you, what, what, how do you analogize it as like the organ, uh, an organ in the body of America? I mean, it was, um, it built many 
very strong middle class uh, families, I guess. Absolutely. I mean, I would say it was the engine of the middle class. When we think of the rise of the middle class in the United States, that kind of post-World War II middle class, the auto industry is the engine of that. And so give us a sense of like, you know, when we're talking about, I guess we're talking uh, 40s, 50s, uh, maybe into the 60s on some level, like what, um, how did that manifest itself in terms of jobs that the the car companies had in terms of innovation, in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, the value to communities? I mean, I guess you could just look, you could look at Detroit. I mean, there are other problems, obviously, that Detroit has had, but they were the sort of the catalyst for a lot of the problems were was the sort of uh, decisions that ultimately were made by these car companies. I don't want to get too uh, ahead of ourselves in terms of the decisions, but I want to get a sense of like what what value did it bring to the country? Yeah, so really uh, late 40s, kind of 50s, 60s, even into the early 70s, right? It's early 70s that it starts really changing. Um, that this is the largest industry in the country and, and that other large industries were industries tied to it, right? So it's not just made, uh, auto assemblers, but then the steel industry is tied to the auto industry, the glass industry, the rubber industry, all the components, uh, all the companies that make components for the cars are tied. Um, and they were all kind of clustered in the same productive areas. So you think of Detroit or Flint or you know, Indiana um, St. Louis, you know, many of these kind of rust belt cities uh, were built by auto, right? Auto was central to them. And then all these other industries clustered around auto. Um, and I think look, just Detroit and Flint are such a, a good example, just comparing now to 1960. In 1960, Detroit was per capita the richest city in the United States. And I don't remember the ranking, but one of the richest in the world. Wow. Flint, for small cities, was the richest in the world. Um, I don't remember how what the definition of small cities was where I, where I read that, right? But so both of these cities that in 1960 were just auto production centers, the people that lived there were really benefited from this. And today, Detroit and Flint are both among the poorest cities in the country, right? There's, they have many different struggles that we're aware of. Um, but, but this kind of really illustrates what the effects on communities have been of this change in the U.S. auto industry. Um, And when we think about uh, people being able to become middle class, own a home, you know, own a car, send their kids to college, uh, part of this was, you know, that the auto industry, you didn't have to have a college degree to work in the auto industry. This was semi-skilled work. And once you got in and worked for a while, uh, you were part of the union that the pay was was good. The benefits were great. And people built lives off of that, right? Like, uh, you could have one, one parent working and support an entire family. Um, and that's just, that's not the case economy wide anymore. And of course, in the auto industry, the pay is still really, really good. If you kind of adjust for inflation, it's not that different right now than it is in 1960. But part of the problem is that there were 300,000 workers just at GM in 1960. There were probably, you know, half a million workers at GM and Ford. If you put Chrysler in there, you're getting close to a million workers. And that's just not the case now, right? Now it's maybe 250,000 workers for the three companies combined. Right. And Um, we should say with that million workers, there was a whole host of ancillary with jobs that were tied to that. I mean, even in exactly. 2000, even in 2008, when we had to step in and uh, rescue the car industry, people were estimating that if the U S car industry goes under, if GM and, and, and uh, Chrysler and Ford go under uh, in those circumstances, you're bringing down close to two, two and a half million jobs. So, I mean, if you maintain an algorithm of the, uh, in that late of a day, you know, almost like a, uh, 10 to one type of situation. Um, it's conceivable that at its peak, the automotive industry, the U S branded automotive industry was responsible for, you know, possibly like three to 7 million jobs, it seems, or even more. And and that's at a time when our population's that much smaller. Right. Exactly. And then this is, this is part of where that for me, this is this puzzle. It's not just that, hey, what happened to this industry? It's, 
it's the largest, richest industry in the largest, richest country in the history of the world. That's a puzzle, then. What happened to that? So, so part, right, part of the story of it being such an important industry in 1960 is that unions and workers were really strong, right? So if you kind of backtrack into the beginning of the auto industry in the 1910s and 20s, it's not this great engine of middle class wealth. The uh, auto jobs aren't really wonderful. Um, it, it was workers kind of unionizing and using collective power and collective bargaining that turned those jobs into these fantastic kind of ladders into middle class lifestyle and, and into prosperity that then benefited all of these communities. So part of the story of the decline of the auto industry is also the decline of unions, the decline of union power. It goes hand in hand. And that's, you know, this, we're telling both stories a little bit. And in fact, in some respects, and I think uh, this is, you know, um, uh, largely what you found in your research, that uh, there was actually a causal, a causal relationship, almost a, um, m- almost like a multiple uh, causal relationship to those two dynamics. The Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, almost a dialectical relationship, right? That yeah. They're related for a reason that the union kind of decline comes from decisions made by auto management and that decline then feeds back into the loop. And, you know, we go on and on through history to where we are today, but they're absolutely part and parcel. And, 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 and before we sort of start to address that dynamic, I just want to make sure that we understand that this is not a situation of those jobs leaving Flint and Detroit uh, and those same jobs landing somewhere else that they're dispersed, it is they're outsourced to other countries or they are outsourced to places that don't have unions that have uh, that are so-called right to work states where the quality of the jobs, frankly, is is less. Right, exactly. It's not that a good job left split in Detroit and then a good job showed up in Chattanooga or in, you know, the Philippines or Mexico. It's a good job left one in Detroit and then a bad job showed up in these places that don't have unions and don't have regulations. And we also and I think and, and there's an argument, maybe this is a subsidiary one, but the the concentration of the jobs added to um the the quality of life in these cities. I mean it, there was a lot of like uh-huh. um uh, auto mo- uh, um, uh, auto worker money in Flint in Detroit, but that meant like if I own a restaurant, I'm also doing well and and, right. and, and whatnot. Whereas if you've got one plant outside of uh, you know in uh, in Tennessee, it does not necessarily have the ability to dr- to dramatically impact. Um, maybe to some extent, but not dramatically impact, particularly with, when the wages are less. But let's get into this uh, dynamic because it's fascinating. So describe the, we should probably start, I think, unless you disagree, with the mode of production that took place in this era that that, uh, that car companies had basically uh, created for themselves, uh, flexible production, you call it. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so so kind of starting the real difference. So all of the the domestic market share that they keep losing goes to, mostly to Japanese auto companies, a little bit to ones like Volkswagen and some of the European. And what really uh, draws them apart, these kind of foreign automakers from the U.S. ones right now, is quality of cars and innovation, right? So they're innovating in the process of producing cars, and they're able to do it very efficiently and have high quality output. Um, and so in, in studying why that is, uh, scholars have kind of identified certain things like just-in-time delivery um, as being really efficient. And so we looked at what... Explain what just-in-time delivery is, just for, for people. Right. Who- so just, yeah, sorry. Just-in-time delivery is a uh, component parts. So the way the U.S. companies do it now and the kind of standard way uh, is let's say I'm going to make a hundred cars. I'm going to order parts for 300 cars and I have a stockpile of parts. And that way, if I need to, you know, if there's a slowdown somewhere, something goes wrong um, with my components maker, I, I, I don't have to stop producing cars because I have a bunch of extra parts. Um, and just in time delivery says, if I'm going to make a hundred cars, I order parts for a hundred cars and that's it. And I get them right when I need them. Um, 
And this means that there's no waste. So if there isn't a slowdown at all, and I ordered those 300 parts, now I had 200 parts that I didn't need, and that's a bunch of waste, right? right. Um, under just-in-time delivery, I don't have that waste. Uh, and so that, that's one of the things that's been identified, is oh, this is a really efficient way. It's been called lean production. Um, what we did is we looked at how does this relate to innovation, and we found that there's more than just a just-in-time delivery. It's a, it's a key component of it, but there's this whole, what, what you said, what we call flexible uh, production that goes into it. And so uh, just-in-time delivery means that if we come up with a new way of doing something, right, and that means that the old component doesn't quite fit, it needs to be tweaked in order to work with the new way we're doing something, uh, I'm not losing any money by doing that. If I have a giant stockpile of extra parts, now those are totally useless if I change that. So it kind of works against innovation. It's hard to implement the innovation because in order to do that, I'm losing money. So now there's a, is the innovation going to save us enough money to make it worth losing the stockpile? But with just in time delivery, I, I have exactly what I need. So in the next, the next run through, I just order different parts from my parts maker. This requires though, a, a good amount of trust with the parts maker. So along with just in time delivery, flexible production has long-term sole sourcing contracts um, with suppliers. So rather than saying, who's my supplier going to be, whoever offers me parts the cheapest, I'm going to get a contract with a supplier and I'm going to keep that long term. I'm going to let them know you are my supplier. And let me just let me just to... tease this out. So I mean, uh, so that people understand. So sole sourcing is basically where I get into a relationship with you. And uh, I, I just like I'm not I you and I are in this together. And exactly. and so I'm not going to come I'm not going to come back to you next year and say, hey, there's somebody else offering me the parts for cheaper. Can you lower your price? Right. I'm, I'm not looking for anybody else. We're in this together. We're in this together. And, and it, the benefit to me is that if uh, I make a mistake, my engineers make a mistake and we get a bad part and I get a switch, um, or if it's even a close decision, I'm not unduly inf influenced by the uh, sort of like sunk costs of all these uh, bad parts I have or um, so I don't put off innovation and I don't have to pay more to innovate. Right. Exactly. So if I want you to change a part for me, well, we have a long term relationship. You're going to be willing to do that. So say, Hey, can you make the part like this this time? And you're willing to do that. And you're probably doing just in time delivery of your own parts so that you can innovate with me. And you had up with long-term suppliers from your, the raw suppliers that supply you to make the components. So this goes down the line. Now, if I'm going to do that, uh, sometimes I've made all the, I, I've, I've used the components that came in and none, none have come in yet, right? Uh, I have to, you have to ship the parts to me. That's a huge risk because if the parts don't get to me now, I have to shut down production because I don't have right. any parts. So I don't want you to be very far away from me. So what happens is we start to cluster. The final assembly plants um, cluster, they cluster with the components plants. The components plants cluster around them. So it's only going to be a, you know, a, few, a few miles, 100 miles at most that you're going to be shipping these parts. Oftentimes, it's just down the street. That makes it easy for us to innovate also. You're right there. I tell you, hey, could you change this part like this? It goes. Now, once we cluster, like you, you, you pointed out, the benefits to the community of having everybody there, it's also a huge benefit to in innovation because innovation is really a trial and error process. I have this idea. I try to do it. It doesn't quite work. I want to know why it's not quite working. The rank and files are the rank and file workers are right there trying to implement it. They can tell me why it doesn't work. The engineers are there. The designers are there. The engineers and designers for the components plants are there. And everybody, it's easy for everyone to meet and figure out how do we best implement this. So it just results in innovations being implemented in a more timely manner and resulting in higher quality work. Whereas if we're dispersed all over the country, it can be, just be hard to communicate and figure out how it works. We'll eventually get it, but it'll take longer. We'll lose more money with it. It adds to that. Uh, it, it adds to the calculation of, is this really worth it? I have this huge stockpile I'm going to lose. We keep trying to put it in. It's not working. I might make the decision to say, well, we just won't innovate, right? Or maybe I innovate, but it costs me a lot of money. Um, and then the final thing is because oftentimes stations will be idle as we're trying to figure out how to implement a new innovation, I'm going to have machinery that can do multiple things. I'm not going to have single purpose machinery. I'm going to use flexible machinery so that while we're trying to figure out an innovation on one part of the car, the machinery can be used to do something else. And that kind of totality, geographic concentration, flexible machinery, 
just in time delivery and sole sourcing of parts is flexible production. And it's highly innovative, not just in terms of discovering innovation, but really in terms of implementing the ideas and implementing them in a quality manner. Now, and so what are now just mm-hmm. to be clear, this was the type of production that uh, American car makers exhibited uh, back in the in the fifties and sixties. That, not the 60s. So what we found that was interesting is this is the type of production the automakers exhibited kind of pre-World War II. And then starting around 1950, they started changing out. And by the 60s, it's largely gone. By the late 60s, it's gone. Um, so interestingly, at the height of profitability, they're not using this. And it's because they all got rid of it and they didn't have any competition using it. And this is part of getting rid of it is they abandoned this system and they didn't see any problem for like 20 years. They, they were the richest industry still and it was fine until other companies showed up using this innovative system and they were no longer using it. And then all of a sudden they lost all their market share. So they couldn't compete because these other companies were highly innovative and they were no longer innovative. So what happens in the 50s and 60s is advertising. The auto companies are no longer really innovating in terms of parts and process. And so they start making surface level changes to the cars. This is when you get some of the scandals where they find out that the really expensive luxury car has the same engine as the basic car and they just name it something different and, you know, do a paint job on it. Right. Part of this is because they're not innovative anymore, right? So they're going to sell the people based off of um, style. And the advertising industry really, in many ways, kind of grows around the auto industry, around this need to sell cars that aren't innovative anymore but it works because nobody's challenging them right ford gm and chrysler are all doing the same thing in the 60s uh and so they still they still make their money and it's fine it's not until toyota shows up and volkswagen shows up and they're using this old system um and they can't compete with them so yeah so before world war ii though the u.s the u.s production system was very, very similar to flexible production. Um, It had all the same kind of features of it. Uh, Little details are different than the way Toyota does it. The way Toyota does it, little details are different than Nissan, but all in all, what I described was present pre-World War II U.S. and is present in foreign auto companies now. And interestingly, it was super innovative before World War II also. So uh, there's been studies that track innovation. It was just off the charts innovative. So, uh, and and just just to be clear, when we say uh, that flexible production is um, is evidenced now by foreign car car companies, uh, including the ones that are operating in the U.S. Yes, so that's been one of the the big things uh, in terms of kind of globalization and outsourcing has been the different way that say Volkswagen or Toyota does globalization versus General Motors and Ford. So when Toyota moves production to the U.S. They don't just assemble the cars there. Also, they also recontract with new parts suppliers that cluster around that assembler. So when Toyota has an assembly plant in the United States, they also have all their components points around that, and they don't really ship many parts from Japan. So they're building the car. So this is one of the interesting things where you say, what's a U.S. car? It's complicated. The Ford GM and Chrysler cars – have a much smaller percentage of American-made parts than Toyota and Volkswagen cars. That's fascinating. Because of flexible production, Toyota doesn't really import very many of their parts. They're going to make the vast majority of them, I think it's something like 89%, 90% in the U.S. because because they need to, right? Just-in-time delivery and all of that doesn't really work, and the innovation doesn't work if they don't do that. Whereas the U.S. companies, they're not, they don't, they're not using that system. Their interest is in cutting costs. And so for them, importing the parts is great. They can go build the parts somewhere with cheaper labor and then just ship them into the U.S. and, and assemble them. So, all right. So now let's get to the, um, the, 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 the why. Uh, and right. it is, the, the clue is in um, the, descri- the description that you've given us of, of flexible production, which is, when you, you said, you know, when you have a sole source relationship with a supplier, you got to trust them. And that means that you also got to trust their workers. And it means that you've got to trust their suppliers and their uh, suppliers' workers. And you've got to trust your uh, workers as well. Um, I mean, if I, have, if I have 300 parts, if I have 300, I don't know, side view mirrors and um, I'm building 100 cars, you know, this month, 
and your um, your workers go on strike, I'm fine for another couple of months because I've got extra stuff here. And so that decreases the leverage that the workers have in terms of basically shutting me down. Right. Exactly. And so they uh, the the car makers figured this out. So. Well, just like, well, this is what your book is about is like the uh, give us the sense of like what was going through their minds where they said, we've got this great production system that has driven this industry, uh, made us tops in the world so much so that we're going to be able to coast for 20 years just by, you know, uh, putting a fresh coat of paint on stuff. Right. Why would you change that? Right. Well, so. The, the big the big story is to weaken worker leverage, right? And that uh, workers had gained so much leverage that the demands were starting to not just be, hey, we want better pay and better benefits, but we should have a say in the production process. We should be a part of deciding things. Um, and that was just anathema to U.S. management. The, that part is certain, and there's a story around that. There's a less certain part, which is how much did the U.S., auto companies understand about this system and why it was so innovative. The way they came about this system was really a, a piecemeal trial and error way of evolving the flexible production system. Um, and so it's not, it's not implausible that they didn't fully understand why it was innovative and think to themselves, eh, we can get rid of this, this, and this, and it'll be fine. Right. right. It's also not they also may have understood it. So that part, it's not really clear how much they understood. What's clear is the comparison, the, the Japanese automakers and, and some of the European, like Volkswagen, they absolutely understand it. They came about flexible production by copying the U.S. companies, by saying, hey, this really works great. We're going to bring this back to our, our countries and, and do the same thing and improve on it. And so they know, what the, they, they know what they're doing, and they know what they'd be giving up to get rid of it. Whereas the U.S. companies, it wasn't clear how much they understood about what was innovative, but what they understood, what they came to learn was absolutely its relationship to worker power. And so this starts with the Flint strike in 1936. It's kind of the, the dawn of the United Auto Workers, right? The United Auto Workers is just almost no, nobody at, the, at that time. I think um, out of General Motors, you know, 300,000 or so workers, they had a couple hundred workers that were members of the UAW. But because of those sole sourcing contracts, because of the way that production is concentrated, they didn't need more than a couple hundred workers to shut down production. So they have this sit down strike where a couple hundred workers at these key plants that produce parts for all the cars GM's producing decided we're not leaving the plant and we're going to sit down and now this plant can't produce anything. And that means all the way down the production line, General Motors is shut down and there's just no way to beat that. So GM's just losing, you know, millions and millions of dollars and they they give in. You know, part of the story is they GM tried to get the government to eject the workers. They tried to have police go in and inject them. Nothing worked. And, uh, you know, a couple months later, GM gave up. And it was the first time workers had beaten a company like this, a huge corporation that owns the town they're in. And within a couple of years, the entire auto industry is unionized. A few more years, you have kind of this massive industrial unionization. Um Right after the Flint strike, General Motors builds a plant in Buffalo, New York, with the explicit, explicit logic of we need to build away from labor militancy in Flint. So they're already saying we need to have options because that killed us last time. But there's this belief among management that it's not really their workers that are upset and radical. It was outside agitators, these communists that came in from the outside and riled up their workers. And if they could just get rid of them, that would probably fix things. And management really seemed to believe that. So when World War II hits, the outside agitators, the leadership of the UAW, agrees to a no-strike pledge. And auto management kind of thinks like, okay, that's, that's the answer, right? This is going to prove our theory here that we got these, these radicals to agree not to strike. The workers will be happy and we'll go through. And what happens is the rank-and-file workers go on strike anyway. And there's just this rash of wildcat strikes. Wildcat strikes are strikes without the um, approval of national leadership. So in all these localities around the country, workers would just have a grievance. Management would listen to them, and they'd go on strike anyway. And because the system was still set up the same with this flexible production system, a few workers in a local area could shut down the plant and shut down the rest of the company, and, and the company would fold every time. So the strikes were massively successful. And auto 
kind of learned there that, well, this is a structural problem we have here, and we're not, we're going to keep losing, right? And when the war ends and we lose the no strike clause, it's going to get even worse. And the workers started asking for things such as a say in the production process. How fast does the line go? Where do we produce things? Um, wanting more than just wages, uh, wanting an ability to long term keep their uh, ensure that the things that they win remain victories, right? Because the, the history is that they win something and then it gets rolled back the first chance management gets. And that was something management decided they just couldn't abide. And so they decided to undo the power they had and decentralize production. So you're not going to have sole sourcing contracts anymore. They're going to build parts and multiple, uh, multiple plants separated by, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of miles so that it's harder to shut anyone down. They can always you shut one down, they ramp up production and another. Um, they started carrying stockpiles, so they did away with just-in-time delivery. Um, and then those two changes change everything else. Once you're not doing sole supplier and you're not doing just-in-time delivery, you don't need flexible machinery anymore, so you can move to cheaper single-purpose machinery. Um, and, uh, you know, down the line, the whole system changes and we get what we have now. It's fascinating. And so the it wasn't just a question of, What's it? I mean, how did that the the worker control stuff like? What was it that that was really driving? Was it just like I don't want my workers telling me you know how to make a car, or was it like if they ask for this, they're going to be asking for that? I mean, was it a question of like ultimately did it come down to profits, or was it just some semblance of like pride, or I mean, right. what what so, was it that they were afraid yeah. of? I mean, certainly a, a big part of it was this workers aren't going to tell me how to run the company, but it wasn't just that, right? There was a logic of it, of this kind of almost slippery slope of if, if we give in here and then we're giving in there, what's, when does it stop and workers are just running the company and not us? And what's interesting is it's tied to profits, but it's more than profits. It's really about power. It's the idea that profits are dependent on the power differential between management and workers, right? That at some level, if you can't pay your workers collectively less than the value they're producing for you, there's no profits. And if you don't have power over the workers, that's not an option. And so even though they're super profitable at the time that this conflict is happening, you might look at that and say, what was the problem? Your GM at this time that this conflict is happening is the first billion dollar company. You'd think you'd just say, hey, whatever, sure, give the workers something. We're all rolling in riches. And instead, they decided to drastically change their entire production system. But part of that is this forward-looking thing that says, there's under this production system, if workers want, they can take the whole thing over, right? They, they, they have so much leverage. We really can't compete with them. We have to give them whatever they want. And if they start asking for a share in management, when does that stop and become a thing that does cut into our profits? Because we can't, we can't really exploit their labor anymore. They're able to extract the value that they produce at such a level that our profit rate starts falling. And they decided that in order to kind of keep that power, it was worth it to drastically restructure. How much of that anxiety is real or is there any way to know? Like, I mean, I can, you know, like, I, right. I, I mean, I, I'm sure they felt it, but I mean, how much of it was, is legitimate from their perspective? <laughs> A little, like, yes and no, right? So there's an element of, look at Toyota, look at Volkswagen. They've been able to keep flexible production and through various methods, keep workers happy enough that they don't unionize and they don't strike. So Volkswagen, they just held a union vote in Chattanooga and the union lost. Right. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. But yeah, part of I mean, a lot, a lot of them are cultural, though, right? I mean, with the South. I right, think that's and, a and part of it is when the union when when the union votes coming up, management came in and said, "Hey, you're going to get a big raise. You're going to get certain things." And the union, if you get a union, we might close the plant down. And for some workers, they're going to look at that and say, "It's not worth it." Right. So one of the things that uh, we brought to this analysis is um, social movement theory and social movement. What people that have studied social movements and this idea that. Oftentimes what mobilizes people into a movement or into a union is it's not a change in I was against a union and then I saw the light and I'm for the union. It's a change in what I believe can actually win. So I'm not, I, I might be a worker and I know, hey, unions are fine. Unions are great, but I think that we're going to lose. 
And given that we're going to lose and the risks involved in losing, I'm not going to support the union. Right. And so Toyota, Chattanooga, they've been able to do just enough to convince people that the union's not worth it. You get just enough from us. You're probably going to lose anyway. And, and they, they keep it off. So in that element, maybe, you know, you could say the fear wasn't as legitimate as they thought. There's techniques to forestall some sort of radical worker takeover of the system. Um, there's there's an ability to share just enough of the profits that workers are kept happy enough that they're not going to do that, right? So in that element, you could kind of second guess them and say, wow, why didn't you just share a little bit more? Say, sure, we could have you a works council like they do in Germany. And maybe that would have kept the union happy and everything would have been fine. But there is a reality to if you can't placate the workers, if you can't make them happy, if you offer them things and they say, we don't trust you, we've been working with you long enough, and when the depression hit, you took everything away, we don't trust you to do it on your own, we want to have a say, that they are correct and they're worried that flexible production does give the workers that level of leverage, that they will win, um, that it's, it's not really. And so this is part of the Chattanooga thing is, the union didn't take advantage of that leverage at all, right? So another reason they lost is they took no advantage of the structure because uh, Volkswagen uses flexible production. They just didn't right. take advantage of that. They kind of organized the same way that they organize in GM and Ford and, you know, for the last 30 years when they haven't uh, had flexible production. That's, wow. That's, I want to say funny, but that's not the right word. Um, the The unions became just as ossified by the ossification of the, the car companies that they were working for. Yep. So we have this story of the unions being so afraid of, of labor and, and perhaps justifiably, but perhaps not that they essentially um, restructure themselves into worse car companies that are, um, that can't, function well but can keep themselves from being at the mercy of their workers and that's the story that we we have today what are the chances that that can be fixed i mean it seems to me that like even the union doesn't well all right let me ask you i have one more question before we get to that because it's also like the, it, mm -hmm. it shows that the union doesn't fully understand this dynamic either that you're talking about the only people who figured it out it seems like were the German and Japanese car manufacturers? Presumably, they came in and studied how these these um, these these uh, car manufacturers worked. Did when they when when the big three went to this sort of more uh, dispersed and I guess it's called uh, dispersed or parallel production, uh, which is you know duplicative and and it's like hedging their bets in a lot of places. Right? Did they? Was there a moment of? hey, we're bringing in somebody from McKinsey and they're going to explain to us how we do this? Or was it just sort of like, oh, I know, these guys, uh, they're, you know, they're meeting down at their, uh, their union hall over here. Now you can go meet at union hall all you want because the, because the, the factory's going to be in Buffalo. Yeah, like, I, I think that was more like it, right, absolutely. That, okay, you, there's no, yeah, there's no unions over in Buffalo. The union's the problem here, sent it to Buffalo. Uh, you're going to shut down production here. We'll build the same parts, you know, in Nashville or in St. Uh, you know, in, in Chattanooga. And, and now it's not a problem. So it was really pointing to what, what's the, how are they beating us? And let's just undo that. Wow. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the unions apparently don't know this story either because they didn't realize they were trying to win a big vote to, in, in trying to sell their notion of power, but it doesn't sound like they, they basically said, Hey, we're going to give you an exhibit of this. We're, right. One right, of our, exactly. we're going to have a wildcat strike at a supplier. Watch how we bring these people to their knees. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and it's interesting. There's a question. The union leadership doesn't seem to get it, but then there's an element where the union leadership is also stuck in this position of weakness. And it, it almost seems to me that, they are so focused on just keeping the scraps that they have that they can't see the kind of longer, broader movement of, of, of that, of right? Like, let's show you how we can bring them to their knees, and then we'll win not just this battle, but many more. Uh, it's that they've been weak for so long in, with the big three that they'll, they'll take what they can get. They'll be in a, a, a tiny little wage increase. Cool. Just keep that so we can say, look, we got you something. 
Um, but there's a question of do the rank and file workers get it? And, and clearly mm-hmm. they're not going to get it in the same way that, that I get it as someone that studied this kind of long historical, I'm standing back from it. But I think there's elements of it from what I've heard um, from people that kind of are, are embedded on uh, with the rank and file workers, where if you were to bring them the idea, any of the ideas from the book, they'd say, yeah, that's right. That's well, right. that's what I was going to ask, because I so would I imagine think kind of, I think a lot of these, of a lot, you know, like just in terms of geographical proximity, a lot of these people have seen teachers in, if, if not in their state, in neighboring states, do this type of thing where exactly. they, they, um, they find their leverage points and there just seems to be a, a, it's in the air and people are understanding it a little more. And in terms of bringing back innovation and leadership to the U S based branded car industry, it's your opinion that it's basically over, right? Like they can't, they, they can't get out of this spiral. It'd be too costly at this point to do it. Yeah. So as part of building that dispersed parallel system to undo worker power, it's just, there was so much capital investment that was sunk that in order to reconcentrate production and reinstitute flexibility, the auto companies would have to, throw away a bunch of sunk capital and then invest a bunch of new capital. And at the same moment of that, the trust between workers and management is just non-existent at this point, right? right? It's decades and decades and decades of squeezing workers, closing down auto plants, asking for union givebacks. The minute workers get any leverage, the first thing they're going to do is use that, right? If they're already unionized, the first thing they're going to do is use that to get something, to get concessions. And we've actually seen this. So an interesting thing, it's, it's not as though the auto companies saw the, the foreign companies coming in the 70s, the early 80s, and succeed and just said, what's going on? They immediately knew what was going on and tried to go back to just-in-time delivery, but they never would fully commit. So the minute they'd start to do something, you'd see something like a strike at Wardstown, and that shuts down production and messes up production of the Saturn in Mexico. And then the auto companies would just give up on that and just go back to what they had. Uh, and so it, it's this thing where the G, the big three, the only way they really compete is through cutting labor costs because they can't compete on innovation. And so to invest a bunch when in the process of losing market share, to invest a bunch of capital and give up on existing sunk capital and then have the union win concessions all at the same time, it's just something management's just not, they don't do, right? They're, they're not going to do it. Um, so there's this element of, could it could it be done? Yes. Will it be done is the question. I, I just think, no, I don't think that the uh, the U.S. auto management is going to make that decision. Um, so, and they're not going to do the things they need to do to have the worker trust. So part of it is in order to reinstitute flexibility, workers have to be part of it. right? They have to be a key component. It can't just be, we're doing this from the top down. It would have, They'd have to be part of reinstituting this which would probably mean giving huge benefits to them before doing it and saying, winning their trust back and saying, Hey, sorry, we screwed you over the last 30 years. Here's a bunch of stuff and you can have a say in how we do this. Now let's do this together. And I just, that seems to be uh, highly improbable as a thing that auto management themselves would, would take the lead on. So, um, so where does that leave us? And I asked that because, and I, I, I rarely reference the acknowledgments uh, when I uh, interview someone about their book, but um, you you started your book by thanking W. B. Uh, du Bois and mm-hmm. um, that um, that that social structures are constructed by people and therefore can be destructed by those who are on the wrong side of privilege, and um, that the the idea of this type of 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 research um is in service of social movements so where you have this information is this is this book i mean in terms of you think about like who could use this book is it is it basically just workers for toyota and uh volkswagen or where else where is the application for this stuff so immediately, yeah, workers at Toyota and Volkswagen could use this and say and see, well, we have way more power than we thought. We could get way more. Um, I think that workers at the other auto companies could use it also to see what the 
what the leverage points in the system they're in are, that it may be harder to get leverage, which doesn't mean you don't do it. So, so at the end of the day, there is an element of all of the industry workers have power because auto man- management capitalists need workers, right? So you, it's just a matter of how many workers do you need to collectively act together and for how long do they have to withhold their cooperation in order to get concessions. And so, you know, when you have high leverage, it's not very many workers and you don't have to do it for very long. And then there are other systems that might need to be more, but that doesn't mean you don't have any leverage and you can't win. It's just harder. Um, the other thing is it can be applied outside of auto. It can be able, it's one of those things you can look at the teachers unions and see, oh, I see what they're, I see why they're winning now, right? They're doing what this book talks about the auto workers doing. They're doing that same thing. And so the, the, if there was a hopefulness to it, it is that there is something in the air. There is a rediscovery among workers in the United States of the idea that they have leverage and they can act collectively. And it's almost unions are involved, but it's almost this breaking away. There's, there's kind of an old guard of union unionism that became this business unionism. Yep. Once radicals were thrown out in the mid fifties and unions declined in power over the next 20 years, that was just, Let's secure these tiny little benefits for our, our workers so that we stay in power and can be partners with business. And it hasn't really served the working class very well. It, it, and almost, I see something where, it almost looks like but, the, the car unions uh, became, just started looking like the car companies. It's like, yeah, it was like that dynamic where, you know, people, you know, their dogs look like them or something like that. Right, right, exactly. And so... It seems as though workers, rank and file workers, are discovering this, this, the truth that, is that they have the power and they have the leverage. Unions are, are supposed to be them. Unions are just them coming together. It's not a separate entity um, that they don't have to listen to leadership, that when they see a leverage point, they can act collectively. And, you know, that's what the teachers unions did, that their leadership didn't want to take direct action. And the teachers just did anyway, and they won. So that's in the air. And with the knowledge of how kind of structure can be leveraged to give you maximize your power, I think that workers could utilize that and that can kind of spread and then human agency takes apart, right? We'll see what happens with that. But that, that would be the hopefulness is that workers are rediscovering that. The kind of other end of that is from the management perspective of just management's probably not going to be able to fix it. They're, they're not going to act to fix this. And so any idea of a recovery of the U.S. auto companies uh, not really, right? That the recovery after Ob- the Obama bailouts was really about pulling, uh, pulling back gains unions had made, and it was short term. And analysts are already predicting kind of a, a real decline in the auto industry again, decline in sales. T- they're talking about closing plants down. Um, there's moves toward elect- electric cars and self-driving cars. Well, if the history in our, in our books says anything, it's that when innovation becomes important, the companies using flexible production are going to win that battle. So that move into that probably long term is going to benefit Toyota and Volkswagen much more than GM and Ford. So on the company side, it's it's not a happy prognosis. But on the worker side, there is this element that it could be helpful. And the interesting part, right, is that outside of a tiny percentage of shareholders in the companies, if the workers successfully kind of reawaken their leverage and do win, it, it will be good for the communities. It will be good for the country. It's good for everybody. Um, so that part's helpful, right? That, yep. that maybe workers getting power isn't great for the, the half a percent of billionaires that own shares, but if for everyone else it is. The book is wrecked how the American automobile industry destroyed its capacity to compete written with Michael Schwartz. Joshua Murray will put a link to it at uh, majority.fm. Thank you so much. It's a really fascinating uh, uh, look at this, at these, these dynamics in this industry. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna 